uh, there's usually a nice uh, trade-off or bleed over between the foundations course and the creativity because foundations kind of goes deep into the technical pieces, but it inevitably vi- vi- uh, revisits our learning centers, which get activated by the creativity course, which then gets reinforced and nurtured and locked in by true storytelling. So no matter what you do, you end up getting caught in the middle of these two powerful forces for good, which is a point that I made at the University of Pittsburgh a couple weeks ago about maximum accelerated learning for the long haul. And I said, what's see, and I've been studying adult learning theory for 40 years and trying to do it, you know, just so we could do it. I'm not studying it just because I want to know. I want to find out what works, you know, as my daughters would say, you're going to F around and find out. They were, they were shocked that I knew what that meant because I used it in context last night. They said, Oh no, dad, try to be cool. Yeah. And I also told them that I understood the assignment, which is the other big meme that they liked. So uh, I, I actually want to know what works, what sticks in the classroom. There's a good book. Uh, on that, what sticks. Uh, And what I found by far what works the best, and this is what I briefed a a paper at um, at Pittsburgh uh, to the Association of Business Simulation and Experiential Learning, which is the original academic conference that 50 years ago invented, developed, refined, and pushed computer simulations for business schools around the world that they were trying to teach people that their policies and choices have an impact it has a payoff and that you can predict what that is through the use of computer modeling and financial economics so these guys invented that whole field and over 50 years have turned that into a thing that is just you wouldn't take a course without it after 50 years uh, they've pretty much exhausted that entire field. And now it's just a question of which version do you want and how slick is the user interface and all that. And they're trying to reorient towards other forms of experiential learning in order to encompass things like non-financial variables in business models. Because... Not every investment decision or business decision that gets made is strictly on the basis of um, buying and selling their raw materials and products. They have to take into account uh, corporate good citizenship, um, you know, impact on the economy, uh, forex market impacts, war and peace, stakeholder analysis, um, taking care of the community, all that stuff. So we're trying to figure out how to do models. And one of the things that I was teaching them about was that our models have to account for these other non-financial members. So how do you learn about that fast? I said, here's what seems to work the fastest and the longest and the bestest in adult learning. It is the combination of three bodies of knowledge in one learning environment. The first and easiest body of knowledge is the thing that you're trying to learn. If I'm trying to be a mason, I have to learn how to stack bricks and and make the glue, the, the mud, and how to hold the spatula. It's not a spatula, but it looks like one. So there's the technical body of knowledge that you're trying to learn. And everybody that takes workshops takes the workshop because it's their intention to learn that particular. You know something, I want to know it. So teach me what you know, those things, that voodoo that you do. And on that basis, for the last 5,000 years, you know, we've been trying to model the sage on the stage and take what I know, put it on the end of a sharp spear and stick it into your head so that it sticks. And now I can test you on what's stuck, and now you can pass the test. That's the traditional lecture model. Well, we know that that may not be the best way to learn how to actually do things. And so we've had, you got to go to the laboratory and mix the chemicals without blowing up. You got to dissect a frog. You got to build a sample wall so that if it falls, it doesn't kill anybody. 
So there, in the trades especially, there is a respect for craft knowledge, the doing of things. And that the and in soccer the ball teaches the best. The game is the best teacher. So we want to have respect for that experiential component. Well, what's the best trade-off between theory and practice? And how do I incorporate expert knowledge into that? Do I just give you the book and then you monkey around and you try it? Is there some relationship between teacher and student that can increase the speed and efficiency of learning? The martial arts and all the trades understand that, and they require the higher degrees of expertise to become teachers in order to remember what it's like to learn and then see the basic lessons in a new way to see if there's a way to improve it. So by cultivating beginner's mind and childlike wonder, you get reconnected to the foundational fundamentals of whatever it is that you are in some degree of mastery of, of, right? So experiential learning is now a thing. How do I mix theory and practice? How do I incorporate the teacher? Well, the other two bodies of knowledge then that I add to this triad of maximum sustainable rate of learning or accelerated learning is first the story science of Angus Fletcher for creativity, which is like going to the gym to build muscles on the machine and lifting weights to increase your fitness, increase your strength, your capacity to do work later on the things that you're actually wanting to work on. And that means like I may want to lift a bag of feed into the back of my truck. So when I go into the gym, I do the deadlift or the clean and jerk or push the thing up a inclined plane, push the sled, flip the tire. And what I'm doing is I'm doing some efficient, effective exercise that builds my capacity to then go do the work that I want to do. Like I can't bring cows into the gym and lift cows. I got to do, so there may be ways that we can use uh, training exercises in order to build the capacity for the thing that we're trying to train for. So it turns out that to improve the creativity, the energy that comes with it, and the perspectives that come from creativity, that the use of short stories and reflective learning exercises in different domains than the one you're working in turns out to be the fastest way and the bestest way that we found so far to raise your level of creativity as measured by experts in the field. And it's funny because story science is connected to the way that our brains learned in the 10 million years of evolution prior to written language that caused us to become the top of the food chain. That the ability to express what we had learned on the hunt or on the search we could now communicate in a story and other people could grasp it quickly because we had learned to become tribal and to have empathy and that oxytocin, which is the chemical that is released when we make social connections, is a very pleasurable experience and that makes the lessons that are learned when we're being empathetic and telling stories to lock in and become very memorable and thus the wisdom of the tribe was preserved. It's why the bond between mothers and babies is so strong. And, but it also is the foundation of our social environment. The net effect of modern living, and in the extreme case, COVID, breaks those normal physical, biological, social bonds and makes it harder to feel connected, which is why kids are failing to read at grade level across America in a epidemic proportions. It's the least surprising result of all. That's what happens when you shut it down. So creativity science, story science by Fletcher is a way to read these little events from different domains, which frees your mind because you're not trying to bring your personal experience into it and then interpret it your own way. Right? No, you're just trying to live in a different area altogether, and you're open with wide eyes and wonderment 
ah, that story, and it makes me think in a different way, and how do I feel and answer the reflective learning questions. And in a matter of 10 minutes to 50 minutes, you get this extraordinary burst of creativity. You start doing that habitually and log that into your reflective learning journal, and you are accumulating all of these multiple points of view that will enable you to bring new resources to bear on the typical thorny problems that stump you when you try to handle it in the old way. You just shift position on it and see what it looks like on the other side. Go get that little 3D folding dragon uh, uh, exercise. It looks like a dragon. It's just a paper that was folded, and when you walk around the dragon, it's a different thing until you get past the side and you realize it's just a little cardboard cutout. It's the greatest optical illusion you ever saw. I'll send you a link later, but it's funny as heck. And it proves how powerful our visual cortex is. And no matter how many times you see that, and no matter how many times you do that, the visceral shock you get when you realize that that's not really a dragon looking at you, but just a little piece of paper folded, you cannot not feel that. That's what happens when you use the Fletcher creativity and these different stories. I've never told that story exactly in the same way. And the next thing I do after we get done here is I'm going to send that note and exercise to Fletcher and I'm going to add it to the course. So boom, just proof of principle right there. Storytelling leads to aha moments that become emotionally connected. I'll never forget that story of the time I remembered the dragon folding, the blah, blah, blah. So that's the second body of knowledge. Remember, there were three the rule of threes, the thing you're trying to learn, the story science of Fletcher to raise the creativity, and now I got all this capacity to work, and now I come and tell somebody about it. I'm going to now use David Bogie's true storytelling science, art, to build a safe, trusted, truthful, collaborative learning space in which we exchange the aha moments that we individually experienced about the technical trading lesson and the creative science. And in the telling, we thought we knew something about what we learned because we had an aha moment. And we tell a true story about it. But instead, we get the gift of all the other stories of people who were in the same position and got these wildly different reactions. And then we realize just how many different ways there are to respond to circumstances, and we learn those lessons empathetically because we are connected at a human level as a learning tribe. And that emotional feeling of gratitude and forgiveness for ourselves and each other allows us to lock in those stories, and it makes us eager to get back here each week, and it binds ourselves to this continuous learning process. And that's the third piece of this magical triangle, and that is that this is what gives you the enthusiasm to keep going when it gets hard, to do the grind, because you create a sense of obligation with each other on the basis of shared truths and excitement about what else it is you're going to hear, and just the sheer joy of being with your friends and tribal members in a world that makes it hard to find genuine people uh, who are eager to help you selflessly because they know that by doing that they actually get a big payoff and that they're going to be helped tenfold by the true stories that you tell so when you put those three things together the technical content the creativity story science of fletcher and the true storytelling art of collaboration and genuine honesty uh, in the world you get transformational learning it, it just happens, and you can't even help it. You couldn't stop it if you tried. That's what I briefed to the people at University of Pennsylvania. And in less time than it took me to tell you this story, I gave them an experiential learning exercise from scratch to teach them the magic words of safety, trust, truth, and opportunity that I use with my five-year-old soccer kids. And they were so persuaded by that that I had three command performances to redo that for other people in the conference that hadn't gotten it. And they decided to move out for the next 50 years 
on the basis of that formula for transformation because they are recognizing that the day of the computer simulation for financial modeling is over and it becomes all of these other things that they have to figure out how to do in order to maximize experiential learning with their models and their teaching and their in-class and out-of-class behavior. So I say all that simply to say that's my check-in and everything is good here in Kansas and that was my work in progress this week so I feel like I've already told my story so you won't have to listen to that crap again. And uh, and so because my story is over, I'm going to hit the tones and say aho and I'm going to go around and invite you to just introduce yourself in 10 seconds. How are things going? Then we'll go into the story circle and then uh, exchange the true stories in the usual way. So I'm just going to hit the abbreviated tone to announce that uh, Ernie, you're you're on deck. <laughs>